but it's always very meaningful for me to connect with other veterans, um, especially those of Vietnam. My, my precious father was a World War II bottom turret gunner in a B-17. He flew over Normandy. Uh, he came home not quite the same. I wasn't born yet because I'm really only about 29 right now. Um, my mom and my dad were from the greatest generation, grew up in the Depression in South Georgia, didn't have anything. Uh, truth be known, we probably grew up poor because, you know, dad was enlisted Air Force and we didn't have a lot back then. They did have great golf courses, though, for those of you who are familiar with the Air Force. Um, I was happy about that, too, because I could climb into the lake and find a ball and sell it to somebody for a quarter, make myself some extra spending money growing up. But <clears throat> mom and daddy raised us to believe in service. When I asked them what they wanted me to talk about today, they said, well, you can talk for two or three hours, however long you want. Um, you can talk about whatever you want. So I'll talk a little bit about my career and a little bit about my life, but what I really want to do is kind of think about the intersection of life and career and impact. And I know many of you have had incredible impact, and I want to, I got to get out of that light because it's blinding me. I feel like I'm taxiing for takeoff right now. Um, I, I want to do kind of a little bit of survey of, of knowing, knowing who all is here. So if you'll indulge, indulge me on that. So if, um, if you uh, were serving in Vietnam in the Army, please raise your hand prominently so I can see that because I won't ask you to stand up, okay? All right. If you were in the Navy, please raise your hand. Okay, great. If you were Coast Guard, raise your hand. Didn't think so, but thought I'd ask. Um, if you were Marine Corps, okay. Air Force, all right. Dad was on the ground in Ben Wall. Um, who'd I leave out? Anybody else? FBI, CIA, doing some kind of sneaky stuff that that nobody knew you were supposed to be there, right? Yep, <clears throat> yep, one of you, you know, one of you, one of you guys that sneaks up behind people and does bad things. So I'm gonna make sure you stay in the front. Keep my eye on you. Um, uh, any, anyone captured or POW? Okay, um, I'm sure many of you were wounded Please tell me if you were wounded physically, wearing a purple heart. And how many of you were, will admit you were wounded emotionally? Okay. All right. <clears throat> now I'm going to start punching buttons and see if we can get equipped with this thing. So I told you mom and dad um, grew up and we were part of the greatest generation mom and dad were. And I, sadly, I lost my dad when I was 28. And, and this is the flag that draped his casket. And it has great meaning to me. And when I'm going to a special place like today, I usually take it with me because it gives me inspiration. And when I was going up through the ranks and I would get to be a commanding officer someplace, I would always bring the flag and put it in a place of prominence, sit it at the chair, have my dad's name tag, and some of his medals on the chair and I would have a place for my mother with roses if she couldn't be there because I always wanted to honor what my parents did in my life. Um, <clears throat> and they, they taught me uh, first and foremost that it's not about service, it's all about service. And if you're, if you're, let me see your hand if you think you're retired today. How many of you think you're retired? You think you're retired? Oh, boy, we got news for you. Larry, get that guy's name and card, okay? Because every one of you has so much still to give, and I don't care if you're not working full-time anymore, because I'm not working full-time anymore. I work at about six or seven jobs. It was easier when I just worked full-time. But I want, I want you all 
to realize and to stay involved in the lives of the veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan who suffer greatly the same way as you did. You all were so plugged in to business and have, have done great things in the course of your lives, but there are so many youngsters out there that need to be mentored, that, that need you to touch their lives, whether they have served, whether they are still in junior high or high school. We have a, a significant problem in our country with the youth of our nation in some sectors, not all sectors, and you can make an impact there, and I want you to do that still. So one of the things we do as leaders, and I'm assuming that all of you in here are leaders, and I'm also going to assume that you're a great leader. You're either a good leader, a great leader, or a bad leader. Everybody leads whether you think about it or not. And certainly many of you would have, if we talk about what you did in your lives and how you led and the impact you had not only when you were in Vietnam or in the service, but subsequently, you're leaders because you don't go and do what you did in Vietnam without leading. And by the way, I also strongly believe in the leadership of your spouses because they learned to do and to lead because you were gone or because of the things that they were equipped to do by their families, by their education, by their exposure. So when I'm talking, I'm not just talking to the, let's see, what'd you call them? A bunch of old guys? Is that what you told me when you, when you first interacted with me? Said, he, actually saying old guys is kind of nice compared to what he called you, but I won't, I won't tell you that. But you beautiful ladies in the room, who are all very young looking, I might add, you have equal impact and, and equal force and equal capability, and I certainly hope that you're out there making that impact as well. We all learn from history, and if we don't, we're doomed to, mis to the same mistakes of the past. Um, and much of the things in my career, uh, I was a history maker. Um, I was often the first woman in the room. I was not a fighter pilot, by the way. I always like to make sure that you understand that. Uh, I went through a program, if you ever saw the movie, An Officer and a Gentleman, called um, Aviation Officer Candidate School, and I was in the second class of women to go through that program, second year of women. I was the 31st woman designated a naval aviator. I was not allowed to fly combat aircraft because there was a combat exclusion law that was lifted in the 90s. Uh, I instead flew an aircraft, C-130, equipped with, with communications to talk to submarines, ballistic missile submarines and the nuclear triad. So years later, when I saw my dad, right before he passed away, he said, baby, you got one of them top secret clearances? And I said, yeah, dad, I do. And he goes, you remember I worked on missile warheads, right? And I said, yeah, daddy, I do. And he goes, now you know what I did, don't you? And I said, yeah, daddy, I do. And he goes, and I know what you do, but we're not going to talk about it, are we? And I said, no, daddy, we're not. And he said, he said, you know, when I signed up to to be a nuclear weapons specialist, and I've actually gone through some of his paperwork recently in his training, he said, we had to sign something for our clearances that said that we wouldn't tell anybody anything until 75 years after we were dead. <laughs> he said, you got that same thing? I said, no, it's not 75 years after you're dead, but they tell you if you tell anybody, they'll kill you. So it's kind of the same thing. So this is my task, and I've already probably failed miserably, but because I'm talking to you after lunch, you see right here, I'm supposed to keep you awake. And I, I need increased attention and interest, and if I don't get it, I'll be walking around and waking you up, okay? Just pointing that out. We don't want you to be in strong anxiety. We don't want any meltdown. We want to be at optimal performance, and I want you to be awake during the entire presentation. <clears throat> So this is a really busy slide, and most of you guys are using glasses now, and I don't know how many of you can even hear me. How many of you can hear me? Because you didn't have your hearing aid? Okay. All right. So I moved 54 times in my life. I live in Midtown Atlanta now. I lived in 13 states. I went to 25 schools before I finished high school, and it wasn't because they kept kicking me out. I was reasonably well-behaved. I was the third child. 
I didn't count how many times I was on ships removed from BOQs. I never had any routes. I've been in the Pacific. I've traveled with various Pacific Islands, the Philippines, Guam, a little place called Kwajalein. Anybody been to Kwajalein or Johnston Atoll? The only thing there is to do there is run and eat. I taught a year of kindergarten after I graduated from the University of Georgia. By the way, how many people are here that are Georgia Tech people? Um, I don't know. I may have to leave now. How about you? Any of you people, Alabama people? Yeah, I was afraid of that. Take that man out. Get that man. I am a proud bulldog. Go dogs. Go dogs. I spent 34 years in the Navy. I commanded at five different commands at every level. I am the world's best pilot. That is the most important thing you need to take away today is Wendy is the world's best pilot. How many pilots are out there? Okay, the rest of you people can fight for number two. I spent, I, what's? No, best pilot in the world. Best pilot, okay? So I spent two years as a college president once I retired from the Navy because I was, I was involved heavily in education and training over the years, and I really enjoyed that. But being a college president is actually highly overrated because I was suddenly the mother of 1,800 students, not just my own two millennials. And we had a training ship, but I'll get into that later. I spent the last five years doing a little bit of education, business consulting, and technology. But mostly I'm very engaged in nonprofit work, um, both as a volunteer and I'm also the executive director of, of a group called the Captain Richard Phillips Lane Kirkland Maritime Trust. Now that's a mouthful. Anybody remember 10 years ago, Rich Phillips got grabbed by the Somali pirates and then the SEALs rescued him and Tom Hanks made a movie out of it. Well, Rich came back he was home for about a year, he went sailing again for about four years, and then he decided he'd start the trust. And we're heavily involved in education and other kind of nonprofit work. So that was dad. That's the world's best mentor right there. And I grew up with an amazing mentor in my mother and my father. And I was constantly with him when he came back from Vietnam because he he never did transition back into full-time work. He did some entrepreneurship, but he was, and he was not physically wounded, but it took its toll. He had actually had cancer of the vocal cords before I was born, and he could never talk in a regular voice. He talked in a whisper to me, and it was, hey, get over here. So if he was yelling, hey, get over here. If he was loving, you know, and, and just wanted to talk to you, hey, get over here. So it was all kind of the same thing. There was no yelling in my house because he wasn't physically able to. But that was okay, because I responded pretty well to, hey, get over here. But when he came back from Vietnam, he really couldn't talk for six or eight months because he had been yelling over aircraft engines and bombs and whatever going off in order to take care of his troops and to take care of the aircraft and to take care of his pilots. He's also the world's best fisherman. And that's what he would tell you. When he came back from Vietnam and he was physically unable to work really full time anymore, he said, but I am the world's best fisherman. So you, you get the idea here about I know what the best is, okay? And, I, and I'm opinionated too. Um, so dad was the world's best fisherman and that little cooler right there at any, any given time would be full of bass and other things. We, would, we spent many, many pleasant hours out on the river fishing together and I would hunt with him. And I realized many years later when I started studying post-traumatic stress that dad must have suffered from it and I was his therapist. And I was okay with that. But many times we would go fishing and you see those overhanging limbs on the Flint River down in Albany, Georgia. Albany, for those of you from the south. We'd, we'd be down there fishing and all of a sudden he'd say, don't move. Don't move. And he'd reach over with the paddle and he'd flip a moccasin out of the boat and he'd shoot it on the way up. So I, I learned early to do exactly what I was told to do. So if he said, don't move, I really didn't. 
So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, you guys are all leaders, but I just want to remind you of this and the fact that you can never quit. You're not allowed to quit, okay? You're not allowed to just sit there. You're not allowed to not be engaged. You're not allowed to quit. Exposure to many things like ideas and geography and different kinds of people, the things that you all have done in your lives. But because you've been exposed to so much, you need to help expose young people and other individuals who've not been as fortunate as you to new things. Most of us have been through some kind of crisis and arguably getting orders to be deployed to Vietnam can constitute a crisis. Many of you were shot, wounded in other ways, or have endured other crises. I was never in combat simply because of the exclusion laws. Um, I could have been deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan on the ground, but they didn't because they had me doing other things. And sometimes when I would volunteer, they'd go, nope, you're not going anywhere. You're going to just stay here at the Pentagon, which arguably might have been worse. I don't know. Um, Dad's deployment to Vietnam was very traumatic for me because we were so close. And I worried every day that he wasn't coming home. And my straight A's suddenly turned to a struggle to make a D. But I did make a D, and I did get on to sixth grade when he came back. There's a certain sense of courage you got to have, and you know that courage is not about being braver than everybody else. It's sometimes just being willing to take action when other people are not taking action. Sometimes courage is, is out front. Sometimes it's not. There's different kinds of courage. You always got to have honor and commitment. Compassion and humility are important. I don't have much of that. Um, mercy is not my middle name. And of course, I am the best pilot, so there you go. You got to have a passion for excellence. You got a certain amount of self confidence. You got to be tenacious and you got to persevere. So, in the face of all things, you got to persevere. You got to have some technical competence, you know, by golly, you got to be brilliant at the basics. So if you are a doctor, you better be the world's best doctor. If you're a pilot, you better be the world's best pilot. If you fix missile warheads, we hope you don't make a mistake. And you got to have a sense of humor. And I think it's really important to have great mentors and to be a great mentor. And I was privileged about a week ago to interact with some folks and a couple of them called me and asked me if I'd be their mentor. And I'm very honored because one of them wants to be a trauma surgeon in the Navy um, in a few years. And I'm going to help her get there. So every girl's American dream was to grow up to be a Navy pilot. I'm just sure of it. Hang out with other cool Navy pilots. All of these are Navy pilots, by the way. Some of them even became astronauts. I never really was into the beauty queen thing, even though my best friend in high school was. And that was fortunate for me because my mother was the quintessential Southern Belle, and she was convinced someday I would be Miss America. So one year, just in high school, just to get her off my back, I agreed to be the Junior Classical League representative to the pageant. But I was organizing the pageant because I was the vice president of Beta Club. So it was a conflict. But it kept mom happy, at least for a week or two. And when she would bug me about doing something like beauty queen stuff, I would call my best friend, Fran, and say, Fran, could you come over Saturday and give mom a dose of beauty queenism? And I would get on my motorcycle and ride to her parents' house and have coffee and talk about fishing. But I was convinced that uh, every girl's American dream was to be a Navy pilot. And I really did want to be a pilot from early on. I wanted to be an Air Force pilot. But when I went up on the steps of the Bulldog Room in March of 1975, and I walked over to talk to the recruiters, the Air Force wouldn't talk to me. Now, we didn't know, I didn't know back then that they had women pilots yet, because they had just started them. They just started them in the flight program for the Navy and the Air Force. But as I began to go into the Bulldog Room that Friday afternoon, a couple of the recruiters dressed in their ice cream suits said, hey, come over here and talk to us. I kind of felt like they were trying to pick me up, you know, offer me cookies and stuff. But those people became mentors to me and opened the doors for me to become a Navy pilot. One of them retires at Three Star, surface warfare driver, and we're still friends today, and I'm still in touch also with my, my recruiter that was 
someday destined to commission me in the United States Navy. Leaders always seek to grow and improve and take others along, and that's the recruiter that commissioned me, and there I am at Aviation Officer Candidate School, and, and there's my first salute. My dad, because he was enlisted when he knew I was gonna go off to Aviation Officer Candidate School, mom had already cried, of course, and gone back inside, and dad was standing there at the car, and he said, in his wispy voice, said, baby, mom and dad are always proud of you, and you can always come home. If you get there and you don't like this Navy thing, you can always come home. If you get commissioned and you decide you don't, you, you know, flight school's really hard. I've been talking to people about how hard it is. You know, not very many people make it through. You, we're always proud of you. But let me tell you something, sweetheart. If you ever, ever get commissioned and you get your wings of shiny gold, and you're out there as an officer, and I ever hear, I don't care how senior you are or what job you've got, if I ever hear that you mistreat anybody or you think you're better than they are because they're enlisted, I will find you and I will beat your ass. <laughs> so that made a big impact on me. Little. So right here is probably the most meaningful thing I ever got in my career. All of these are the names of the enlisted troops that worked for me when I was selected for Admiral. And I had helped my chief make senior chief, and he took, how many of you know what a, a Navy chief hat box is? Anybody? Nobody, okay. Uh, they have to, they go through a very regimented process when they're gonna transition from E6 to E7 in the Navy and wear khakis. And they go get quarter inch plywood and they have to make their hat box that's going to hold their combination cover. And it's their prized possession and they take it everywhere they go. And so Senior Chief Hardesty was kind enough to take the last little piece of wood left from that and make me a hat box plank that tells me that my troops were behind me all the way. And that has been in every office I've ever had since then, and it's hung proudly in my house. And it means more to me than all the medals I got or anything that I got that wasn't a joint award because it was all about me trying to serve them and help them to get to the next level. And I'm happy to say that every single one of those people, there's about 12 of them on that plaque, at least made chief and a couple of them made master chief, and they're still in touch with me today. Now, leadership, I've already talked to you a little bit. I was the first in a number of situations in, in my life, and, and that's okay, but you like, to be, you like to have some company. I was beginning to get lonely up here at the table because none of you sat with me. I, I didn't know if you didn't like my perfume, but here's my first solo. Here's, here is the first selfie ever created. How many of you guys take selfies? That was me on my solo taking a selfie shot of course, it was a little, a little before we had phones, but, uh, you know, worked pretty well. Came out pretty well. So, by the way, did I tell you that I was a fox? <laughs> so that's me about six months before I graduated from Georgia. I was 20 years old. No, actually not 20 years old. I, I turned 20 just after I graduated because I went through so fast. And that's me... About a week before I went and got all my hair cut off to go to AOCS, my kids call that the Daisy Duke look-alike picture. <laughs> and there I am in my first airplane practicing all those years ago in Las Vegas. So leadership is also about relationships. I've talked about mentoring. It's a team sport. Um, here's me having a little fun with one of my students up at City Maritime. Here's a couple of folks that I mentored. She's now a council member on the West Coast. She, she was one of the first women that was brought into the Blue Angels. She was not a pilot, she was a flight physiologist. Her name's Amy, her dad's a fighter pilot. Um, this is a guy, helicopter pilot, that I mentored to get to two stars. And this is the baby of one of my friends who's an Air Force pilot and somebody had to babysit, so I got elected. Um, this is a group of people that I took to Southern Africa we set up a Women in Aviation International chapter there, and, and those are all my folks. Um, I'm the short one in the front. 
But every one of these people has gone on to do great things. Um, one of them has got his PhD now from Harvard. I, I kind of wished he had stayed on active duty because I was sure he would make admiral, but he decided to do something else. So leadership's multidimensional. It's up, it's down, it's sideways. Um, I, I talk a lot about mentorship. You probably figured that out. This young lady I met when she was eight months pregnant with her sixth child. She was a lieutenant commander at the time. This is when she's a commander, and I took her to southern Africa with me. She since has deployed twice to Afghanistan and the Horn of Africa, and she is now wearing one star. She's an admiral. Uh, these were the guys that took took me out. What I didn't tell you before about this flag was um, I was privileged to go out after I made Admiral on the Admiral's Barge to Pearl Harbor to the Arizona. And these were the gentlemen that, that drove the boat over there. And they flew my father's flag over the Arizona in honor of my cousin because my mother's first cousin is entombed on the Arizona. And I have a beautiful certificate that honors both of their services that's in my home. And that was one of the most meaningful things of my entire life. My dad, when he came back, um, or, or when, when he first visited me when I was stationed in Hawaii, he said, I, I took he and my mom to the memorial, and back then you could still touch the wall. Now they won't let you anymore. But dad, we got on, because they all grew up together, when we got on the, on the boat, just the regular boat to go out when I was about 26. And he went to, he went to the, to, the, to the memorial. He didn't say a word from the time we got on the boat going over to the memorial. He didn't say a word the whole time we were there. He dropped a lay in the water. And, and then he went and he traced the names until he found my cousin's name and he began to weep. And I only ever saw my dad cry a couple of times one was when his mother died. When we got, he didn't say anything for a couple hours again. And, and when we got back to my house, he said, baby, can I call, make a phone call back to the mainland? It'll be expensive. Daddy will pay you for it. I said, no, daddy, you don't need to pay me. You, you call whoever you want. And he picked up the phone and he called my cousin's mother. That was her only son. She years later had a daughter that had never met her brother. And he said, B, I just wanted to tell you that we went and saw Bobby today and we dropped a lay in the water to honor him and his sacrifice and your sacrifice. And she began to weep on the other end of the phone and I could hear her say, oh, thank God, thank God. She was in her 90s then. Somebody's finally seen Bobby and now I can die in peace. And a few months later, she fell asleep and didn't wake up. But one of the great honors of my life was being able to take that flag and have it flown on behalf of my dad and, and all of those that were dear to me who either lost their lives in combat or who served. My uncles all served and, and served well and faithfully. So leaders time, change with the times and they, they change things. I, I was considered a change agent in the Navy. I mean, go figure. I, after all, I was one of the first women Navy pilots, and by definition, when I showed up, things changed. And by the way, some of the guys didn't like it. Some of you guys might not like it, but that's okay. I always thought of myself as an entrepreneur, and the first thing I ever built, my last name is Carpenter, of course, but the first thing I ever built was, was a little um, pretend airplane, so I always loved this. It didn't fly, by the way, and I didn't try jumping off the building, Although my older brother did on a regular basis persuade me to jump off of buildings and do things. So we also don't cling to the status quo. We break barriers. Uh, this was a picture on Wednesday nights. We had fun at Aviation Officer Candidate School. And the drill instructors would tell us to dress up in something fun. So one, one night we did this. You can see that the weapon is as big as I am. I haven't grown a lot since then, by the way. Uh, this was my friend Doug who unfortunately about a year later uh, died in an aircraft accident off of one of the carriers. And this was me uh, roller skating when I was about five. And you know, I'm in that beauty queen outfit, you can tell that I really was aspiring to be the beauty queen. So I don't know if I can trigger this or not. I, in my last command, my, uh, 
My boss, who was the Chief of Naval Operations, put me in command of the Navy Warfare Development Command, and I could talk to you about all kinds of technical aspects of, of what we did there to develop unmanned systems, satellites. I worked with NASA, FBI, CIA on some very interesting and secret programs, which of course I can't talk about or I'd have to do something to you. Um, but, but I was really privileged in being able to, to be dubbed as you're the, you're, you're supposed to go be the innovation queen is pretty much what they told me. So I would travel around trying to get groups to think innovatively, schedule innovation time into their day, how many, of you, how many of you schedule time, not to take a nap, schedule time to sleep, schedule time to eat, you schedule time to work out. How many of you guys work out still? Good for you. Okay. So you schedule all of that. Well, I also schedule time to read and to think and to write my journal because I think it's really important. And we did that in Navy Warfare Development Command. And we did innovation. So we came up with this little innovation video that I thought might wake you guys up a little bit. Can you cue that one up back there? Because I'm not sure I can. There we go. Hope it'll be loud enough for you. fun things I got to do the last five years of my career was, was really um, the best, the best. Uh, I genuinely enjoyed my time. And what I did at Navy Warfare Development Command was, was really think 25 years down the road and try to figure out what's the next thing we need to be doing, what's the next big thing. Um, because the future of warfare is now, and what you all are hearing all the time is about um, North Korea, and Iran and the submarines they have and their development, et cetera. And then of course, we were also preparing a lot for cyber warfare. There was a lot that I did with respect to cyber warfare. And I remember in 2000 sitting in a meeting uh, with the then CNO who said, we haven't quite figured it out yet, but we know cyber is the next big warfare space and we better figure out how to occupy it. Which is a little different when you think about all the changes that happened in the course of your lifetime, uh, and I'll be 63 next month, and there's been a heck of a lot that's happened in the course of my lifetime, you know, you all have really seen a tremendous difference in what's happened. So, <clears throat> I thought you guys might appreciate this. See number four, number six, and number eight. So number four is, my people skills are just fine. It's my tolerance of idiots that need work. Uh, number six, when I was a child, I thought nap time was punishment. Now it's a mini vacation. So I want to see how many, how many of you people are on a mini vacation back there. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. And number eight, even duct tape can't fix stupid, but it can muffle the sound. <laughs> and I'm thinking we're experiencing a critical supply of duct tape, maybe even in this room right now. I don't know. You might be thinking that. But certainly in Washington, D.C. and among some politicians, Yeah. <laughs> 
One of the best pieces of advice when I made Admiral that I ever got was use your stars to remove barriers to other people doing great work. And I did that as much as possible and I do it. And I hope that you think of yourselves that way as well. Because no matter what job you took on in life, what career, what other things you did, you, oh, he's stalking me again. Um, you, you have something equivalent to those stars. And the time goes really fast. I don't have to tell you that. That was the other thing they said to me. They said, you are going to be so surprised how fast your flag career is going to be over and you're going to retire. So I spent about seven years as a flag, and they're right. I could not fathom how fast it was going to go, and I never missed an opportunity to, to use my stars to open the door for somebody else or to remove a barrier. And I hope that you're doing that because there's something you've got that's equivalent to those stars, and you have a responsibility to do that. So that's my transition ceremony where I retired. Those are my two kids. They're slightly taller than I am. You can see that I fed them a lot of broccoli and steak growing up. I had to eat a lot of hamburger. Otherwise, I'm convinced I would have been at least five foot eight or five foot nine. So I tell everybody I am in my spirit. My daughter and I were driving along, coming back from DC, and I said, hey, how about we karaoke at my retirement? And she goes, what? I said, yeah, why don't I? She goes, Mom, you used to say there's not enough beer in China to karaoke. I said, yeah, but I'm not going to China. We're just, we're just going to do this at, you know, Naval Air Station Norfolk. So I actually had a Gladys Knight and the Pip song playing that was you're the best thing that ever happened to me so I could pay tribute to the people who had impacted my career and, and enabled me to get where I got and also who were kind enough to, to be there for my children a lot of times when I couldn't be. But... My daughter is, is, uh, is quite the karaoke artist. You can see she, she probably missed her calling. She should have been on Broadway or L.A. or something, or maybe the beauty queen type. I don't think she is either, though. Uh, so those are a few of the treasured pictures, and uh, the most treasured pictures I have. This is when I was president at the college. Um, this is one of the last things I did on active duty, which was go aboard uh, one of the maritime merchant ships to learn about the Merchant Marine before I took over the college. That's the college where I was. So here's the president's house right underneath the Throg's Neck Bridge. Um, so whenever a semi would go by at 5 a.m., I had a wake-up call, kind of reminding me of the drill instructors. <clears throat> this was our training ship, the Empire State. We had a 600-foot training ship, and we used to take that out in the summertime and go all over the place. It was a lot of fun with the students, and I'd go down to the engineering room and have a great time with them. And we actually had our own fort. See this right here? That's called Fort Schuyler. And my office was right in there. <clears throat> so it was, you know, it was a two minute commute to work if I walked really slowly, which was nice. Um, but I enjoyed that couple years to a point. So you might remember in October 2012, a little something called Hurricane Sandy came up the coast. And we ended up hosting 600 FEMA workers on the campus for a week and with cadaver dogs. And they would come back and they were traumatized because of all of the bodies that they had found in Staten Island and other places. So we kind of turned it almost into a trauma center for them and we eventually moved them on board the ship and they stayed for about three months. And the, the governor was kind enough to give the citation to the ship's crew and to many of my staff on the campus to honor them. Uh, so I'll be wrapping up in just a minute, but I thought you guys might like this. When someone is dead, they do not know they are dead. All of their pain is felt by others, and the same thing happens when someone is stupid. Um, again, might resemble a lot of people in politics or in D.C. these days, I don't know. Okay, the last thing I want to leave you with is, this is a little acronym that, that I came up with because you got to have an obligatory military acronym, right? I came up with this about 12 years ago when I was speaking, maybe even more, I'd hate, I can't do the public math anymore, um, because I was talking to a group of junior ROTC folks who were, who were finishing, and, and what I wanted to do was talk to them about the potential that was opening up for them and so I want to share this with you. 
your life still should be reflective of speed. You know, I mean, I like, I like speeding because I like flying airplanes. And yes, I do drive a fast car, but I try not to get caught. Um, but you should be strategic and significant. And none of us, and me included, have a lot of time left. You know, you think about how many days you've got, and how many hours you've got, and how many minutes you've got in the day. You really need to be thinking about being strategic with your time and significant. I don't care about your level of success. I never did. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care what your title was. I don't care if you're a CEO. I don't care if you were in the FBI. I do care because I want you to be my friend. But, but I don't care about the things that that we think about in this country sometimes are the most important things. What I really care about is how significant have you been in your life? You did things in Vietnam, you did things after that. What does that count for? When people remember you, what does that count for? What do they equate you with? What is the significance you've had today, tomorrow? Larry's back there wanting some help. Larry, right? I got, your, I, I got a card up here. I want to have a conversation with you later if you'll take the time, please. I, I do a lot still in the volunteer space because I think it's one of the places I can be the most significant for the rest of my life. I'm going to someday get around to writing a book. I haven't done that yet. But I have finished half of a children's book because I think it's important to influence the little kids and what they're reading. Many of you have stories that you have not told yet, and you need to record them if you haven't. You need to record them for the people next to you, the people coming after you, and for the memorials that are out there because people care about what you've done and I want to hear about it. You still need to have a plan to impact. You need to be passionate and you need to persevere. And I talked about leadership in, you know, and perseverance earlier. Engagement. I, I'm delighted to see you guys here. You're engaged, okay? And I don't mean to be married, but maybe you are. Um, you're engaged. You need to stay engaged. Until the last breath goes out of your body, you need to stay engaged. You need to stay enlightened, and that means watching TV programs that you don't necessarily agree with, reading some stuff on the internet, actually reading your email and responding to that, um, texting. How many of you text? Let me see your hand if you text. Good job. That's perfect. I've got a 93-year-old friend I go over and fix her computer sometimes for. She's still doing all kinds of internet activity, and, and she's putting her genealogy together for her great-grandchildren, which I think is phenomenal. But we all need to stay enlightened about what's going on. We all need to be thinking and meeting people that aren't like us. You're doing that today because you're a guy and I'm not. Did you notice that? And you have a destiny. I truly believe that I was able to fulfill my destiny in the Navy, and my destiny is not complete yet. I've still got things I'm supposed to be doing. My daughter will routinely say to me, Mom, you know, I don't. there's still something else out there you're supposed to be doing. I go, yeah, I know. But every day I get up doing other things so I can, so I can be ready to meet that next big thing. But I do believe I'm fulfilling my destiny, and... Whether you think your destiny was to go to Vietnam or meet the people next to you, it is because there's some level of contact that you're supposed to have and you're supposed to bring somebody else along to their destiny. I love Einstein and all of his quotes. Each of us has a little bit to do towards transforming the spirit of the times and I think that some of you might agree with me that the spirit of the times are a little rough right now. Um, in a lot of ways, and I think that each of you could be having an impact on that. So I would ask you, when you leave here, think about what are you doing to transform the spirit of the times. So this is the last slide. There actually is one more little thing here that we're going to queue up in a second. This is your afternoon wake up, and then you've got two minutes to ask me a quick question, and, and then I'm going to make up an answer. But in my 34 years in the Navy, I'm really, really proud of my service and of what I was able to do to, to impact the future of the nation and to impact the youth of America and sometimes the old people too. Um, but I'm, I'm really proud of this video that the Navy came up with a couple years before I retired. And, it, and I'd go back and do it all again if I was given the chance. So 
Would you cue that up for us, please? Close it out. Yes, sir. That's the world's best cat. That's wings. Uh, I have a friend. His name's Craig Ray. who's an Air Force doctor. He has a granddaughter that uh, was introduced to me, and she spent about an hour and a half talking to me. She has, uh, uh, this summer, going to be attending the Naval Academy. Would you like to be a mentor? Love to. Get, get my card. Love to. Thank you. I I was not able to go to the Naval Academy or any of the service academies because they didn't accept them until 1976. But I mentor many, many people, many kids to get their right recommendation letters, etc. One of my sea children will graduate from OCS um, on the 24th. Unfortunately, I won't be able to go, and then he's going to flight school. But yes, I, I dearly would love to connect with that young lady. Okay, per perfect. And I. Uh, I routinely go to Baltimore on business, by the way, and get to Annapolis, and I've got a couple friends who were Navy pilots who, uh, who were on staff at the Naval Academy, and they'll connect with her also, I imagine. Okay? One more. You gotta make one up. <laughs> no questions is okay. That's fine. All right, thank you very much. God bless you. God bless you for your service. God bless America.